Hello, this is Professor Keen, and welcome back to my lectures on astronomy, where we are studying the work of Edwin Hubble, his book, The Realm of the Nebula. We've been talking specifically about his discussion of the distribution of the nebula or the galaxies throughout the universe. And he had pointed out in the previous section that we spent some time talking about that space is mostly empty. If you were to count the amount of matter that you see in the universe and its distribution among the universe or within the universe, you would find that there is just one gram for every 10 to the 30th cubic center of space. To put that in more um, understandable terms, that would amount to having one grain of sand in every volume of space that is the size of the Earth. Now let's go on to the next section in the realm of the nebula. This is titled the velocity distance relation. And I want to spend quite some time on this chapter because this is perhaps what Hubble is best known for, his most significant contribution that played an enormous part in modern cosmology. So here's the question. Is the universe static or is it in motion? Now I'm not talking about small scale motion. We all know that the earth is going around the sun and that the moon is going around the earth. I'm talking about large scale motion. If you look at the, the realm of the nebula or the, or the nebula, nebulae that are throughout the universe, is there some large scale motion of those or is it static? And in that view, where the nebulae are located right now is where they have always been located. The universe is stationary. Hubble had a very different viewpoint that was based on the work of scientists like Vesto Slipher. So how do we know whether the nebulae are moving or not? Well, it's based on a technique called spectroscopy. So I want to give you a, a quick introduction to the science of spectroscopy. Let's suppose for the moment that we have a source of light. So we have some kind of bulb right here, a light bulb that is glowing. So I'm going to draw a little lines around it to indicate that it's glowing. And let's suppose we have this light fall upon a barrier. I'll draw a barrier like this. And this barrier blocks the light, but it has a thin slit in it that will allow a small portion of the light, like a ribbon of the light, to make it through. So there's a slit right here that allows a ribbon of the light to pass through the barrier. I've drawn this light to be yellow just so you can see it, but I want you to imagine that this is white light. So this is white light for the moment, okay? Now let's suppose that this ribbon of light that's making it through this barrier strikes a triangular prism, something that looks like this. This is a triangular prism. This was our barrier. And this was our ribbon of light. that was passing through the barrier. What happens when this ribbon of light strikes this prism? Well, you've probably seen pictures of this. If you haven't, what happens is that this ribbon of light gets broken up into various colors and they get bent by different amounts when passing through this prism. So the red light gets bent by a certain amount and the orange light gets bent by a slightly different amount and the yellow light gets bent by a slightly different amount. I'm going to draw all the colors of the rainbow like this. So you get this dispersion or spreading out of the light. And now what you can do is if you put a photographic plate over here like this, this is a schematic representation. Sometimes this is done in a little bit more sophisticated way, but I think you get the idea from this. You have a photographic plate, and where the light strikes the photographic plate, it develops it. And then you can look at the pattern of the light that strikes this plate. So you can pick this plate up. So you can take this plate, pick it up and look at it, and you can see the colors of the light the locations where the film was developed. And uh, what I want to suggest is that if this is white light, 
you'll find a continuous distribution of these colors. That is, there's a kind of a continuous fading from violet and blue to green to yellow to orange to red. you know, kind of colored in like this. So there's this continuous spectrum. Continuous spectrum of light. That is a gradual fade from violet to red. Okay? So that is called the the spectrum of that white light. You can divide it, the prism is used to divide it into these various colors. This, by the way, is something that Isaac Newton had explored it at quite some detail back in the late 1600s, early 1700s, and is described in his book Optics, which was published in, I think, 1703, right around there, where he divided white light into its colors in this way. Now, here's the interesting thing, is that if you look at certain kinds of incandescent or glowing sources, you get a continuous spectrum. So in this case right here, this would be if you're using white light that is characteristic of, as Hubble mentions, incandescent solids. So if you take a solid object like a block of copper or a wire of tungsten and you heat it up, it glows, white light comes out and you get this continuous spectrum. So this would be an example of a, a tungsten filament, tungsten filament uh, incandescent light bulb. You know the old light bulbs that you may still have in your in your house, and it happens basically when you have any heated solid object. It glows with this white light that can be divided into this this rainbow of colors. But if instead of using a white light, you use an incandescent gas an incandescent gas, such as you take a neon gas and you put it into this bulb and you electrify it, you get what's called a neon bulb. Or you could use a sodium lamp, you take sodium gas and put it in a bulb and electrify it. How does that differ from an incandescent solid? Well, in that case, you're only going to get certain colors coming out. That is, you'll get certain lines of color. You might get a red line, an orange line, and perhaps a violet line. So there's not a continuous spectrum. You get a, what's called a discrete spectrum. A discrete spectrum. It's broken up into discrete or separate colors. And the interesting thing is that the pattern of light that you see on the photographic plate when you do this kind of procedure, this spectroscopy, is ends up being a signal or a signature of the particular kind of gas that you're studying. So this provides a very useful way of identifying what kind of gas you're dealing with. This was something that was studied in great detail by a German chemist named Robert Wilhelm Bunsen. He lived from uh, 1811 until 1899. Um, he also did these work with Gustav Kirchhoff, another scientist, and they studied the spectra of various gases. Bunsen, by the way, if the name sounds familiar, he's the one who developed the Bunsen burner, probably in, in the context of heating up various substances and looking at the light emitted by them. This, by the way, this spectroscopy ends up playing a very important role in the modern development of quantum mechanics, the quantum theory of matter, because the colors of light that are emitted by particular gases is intimately connected to the atomic structure of that particular gas. Anyhow, so we're talking so far about what is called, all these are examples of what is called an emission spectrum. So that's what we're discussing here. So this is all emission spectrum because these gases or solids are emitting light when you heat them or electrify them. One can also look at something called an absorption spectrum. What are, what's the difference between an emission spectrum and an absorption spectrum? Well, it's the same basic principle, except what you do is you use a source of white light. So you have white light. 
and then you take some unknown gas, let's say, you put it in a some kind of gas like this in a bulb, maybe this is neon gas in this bulb. You do not heat the gas, it's a cold gas, okay? And what happens is when this white light passes through the gas, the neon gas absorbs particular colors. So the 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 gas The cold gas absorbs only certain colors, and we might say wavelengths, which are associated with colors, colors of light. And the light colors that it absorbs are the same ones that it would happen to emit if you were to heat that gas. So what happens is most of the light makes it through, but there's some missing colors. Okay, so over here, there are missing colors. And you can look at what colors are missing. So you basically get the spectrum of a, a rainbow of colors coming out with a few little spots that are missing. And that would be what's called the absorption spectrum. You could look at the, you could pass the light through a prism, put it on a photographic plate, and you'll see a rainbow with certain missing colors. And these missing colors would be called absorption lines. Because just like these were lines right here, they look like lines are called emission lines, these would be absorption lines. I'm not going to try to draw it there. Maybe I'll show an image in my video. Okay, so that's a quick introduction to uh, spectroscopy. Now, why, why are we talking about spectroscopy? Well, the interesting thing is that scientists at this time were starting to use spectroscopy to understand the color of light that was emitted by stars and galaxies. Instead of just looking through a telescope with your eye or with a regular camera, you could use a spectrograph and hook that up to the back of a telescope and divide the light from the nebulae or the stars into its respective colors, and that would allow you to um, to measure the kinds of elements that are present in the stars. 